Hi, this is Jonas from VSGLWest.com. In this video, we're going to learn how to use the signed and unsigned types in VSGL. In tutorial number 11, we learned how to create signal buses using the standard logic vector type. But what if we wanted to perform calculations on the numbers they represent? You cannot do that with standard logic vectors, because the compiler doesn't interpret them as numbers. They are just arrays of bits whose value could mean anything. Instead, we can use the signed and unsigned types for arithmetic calculations. To get started, we are going to copy off the code from the previous tutorial and save it to a new file which I will name t12 for tutorial number 12 underscore signed unsigned tb dot vhd. Remember to change the entity and architecture names as well. Then we are going to erase all references to the standard logic vector signals so that we are left with only one process containing a wait for 10 nanoseconds line. This will be our starting point for this tutorial. Let's start by declaring a signal of type unsigned. We do that by entering the keyword signal followed by an arbitrary name. I'm gonna name this signal unscount, short for unsigned counter. Then after the colon, we enter the type, which is unsigned. We have to specify a bit range for our signal. I want this signal to be eight bits wide. So inside of the parentheses, I'm typing seven down to zero. Do you remember from the tutorial on the standard logic vector type? This is the preferred way to declare an eight bit range. We can give our signal an initial value. How about all zeros? We can assign zero to all of the bits by using this special others notation. This by the way, is what's known as an aggregate assignment. Then I'm gonna create another signal with the same range and initial value. I will name it sig count, short for sign counter. And of course, the type is gonna be signed instead of unsigned. You may notice that the declaration of these signals look awfully a lot like the declaration for the standard logic vector type, which we learned in the previous tutorial. That's because they are very much alike. The difference is that these signals are interpreted as numbers by the compiler, which means that we can use them in calculations. Let's go down to our process here and create some wraparound counters from our signals. That the signal is wrapping, by the way, just means that when the signal is counted upwards and it reaches its maximum capacity, the value wraps back to the lowest possible number again, just like the odometer of your old car would, if you were unfortunate enough to own it for that long. To implement our counters, we'll just add one to both the signed and the unsigned signal. This will happen every 10 nanoseconds because of the wait for 10 nanoseconds line above. Okay, let's see what these counters look like in a waveform. But there's a compilation error. ModelSim complains about unknown identifier unsigned. This is because just like the standard logic vector, the sign and the unsigned types are not integrated in the VSGL language. To use them, we have to import another IEEE library. We do that by typing use IEEE dot numeric underscore std dot all semicolon. Let's try once more to get this simulation going. Just a quick tip about the waveform window. By default, the signal names in the waveform window include a complete hierarchy, including the module name. They tend to become quite long and take up much of the horizontal space in the window. In the lower left corner of the waveform, there is this button. When you hover over it, the tooltip says Togil leaf names, full names. When we press it, boom, no more long names. Trick number two, by default, the signal values are displayed with their base type. They all start with eight, single quotation mark, H. This means that Molsim displays it as an eight bit hexadecimal. Down here in the command prompt, I can type in radix no show base. Now we have less clutter in the waveform, which makes it easier to work with. If you want to make these changes permanent, you will have to add these commands to the Molsim ini file. All right, back to our signals. We see that the signed and the unsigned signals behave alike. They both have counted from zero to nine, but we have only simulated for about 100 nanoseconds. Every time I click the run button, by default, the simulation runs for 100 nanoseconds. I'm gonna keep clicking the run button until we can spot the wrapping point for these signals. And there we are. They both wrap from hexadecimal FF back to zero again, which makes sense since both signals are eight bits wide and FF is the largest hexadecimal value that an 8-bit signal can represent. If we expand the signal, we can see that at the wrapping point, all bits are one, and then they go back to zero again, just like in the example with the odometer. I'm now creating another signal which I'm giving the name UNS4. 
This is going to be a 4-bit unsigned signal, which I will give a default value of binary 1000. Then I will declare another 4-bit signal with the same initial value, but this one using the sign type. Now I will create another signal, which I will give the name uns8, and you guessed it, this is going to be an 8-bit unsigned. Let's give it an initial value of all zeros. One last signal to create, the equivalent 8-bit signed type. We have now created two equivalent 4-bit signals and two equivalent 8-bit signals. One of each is signed and the other are unsigned. What I'm going to do now is to add these signals we just created. Every 10 nanoseconds this line will be executed and the 8-bit signal will be incremented with the value of the 4-bit signal. Also, I will do the same thing using the signed signals. The two sets of signals are the same length, they have the same default values and they are performing the same addition. Let's see how this looks in the waveform. First, we see that the signed and the unsigned 4-bit signals have the same hexadecimal value of 8, which is 1000 in binary. By the way, numbers in the waveform are displayed in hexadecimals by default. You can change this to binary or decimal, but I find hex the most convenient for comparing raw values of vectors. The two 8-bit signals both start at 0, which is not surprising because that's the initial value we gave to both of them, but after that they behave completely differently. The unsigned 8-bit signal is incremented by 8 every 10 nanoseconds, as one would expect. We gave the 4-bit unsigned signal a binary value of 1000, which is 8 in decimal, so this behavior seems logical. At first it's 0, then 8, then 16, then 24, and so on. The signed 8-bit signal, on the other hand, is behaving completely differently. Initially it's 0, but after the next step it's F8, which is 248 in decimal. Then, after 10 more nanoseconds, it becomes F0, which is 240 in decimal. The unsigned signal is counting forwards, but the signed signal is actually counting backwards. The explanation for this behavior lies in how arithmetic calculations are realized in digital logic. Consider the first step of the calculation involving the two unsigned signals. The initial value of the 8-bit signal is all zeros. To this, we want to add the 4-bit signal, which has the constant value 1000. The two signals are of different lengths, so the compiler must extend the shortest signal. Because this is an unsigned signal, the shortest vector will be extended with zeros. Finally, the addition is performed just like you learned in primary school. Now, let's have a look at how the same calculation is performed for the two signed signals. The 8-bit signal has an initial value of all zeros, and the 4-bit signal has the binary value 1000. We want to add the two signals, but they are of different lengths. The most significant bit of any signed signal is known as the sign bit. By the way, if you don't already know it, the difference between a signed and an unsigned type in computer programming is that the signed type can represent both positive and negative integers, whilst the unsigned type can only represent positive numbers and zero. And this bit right here, in the leftmost position of the signed vector, is the sign bit. If the sign bit is 1, then this is a negative number, and if it's zero, it's not. Because of the way arithmetics work in digital logic, the 4-bit vector is extended to 8 bits using the value of the sign bit as padding for the remaining bits. When we add these two numbers we get 1111-1000, which is F8 in hexadecimal notation. To sum it all up, the unsigned value counted upwards because the 4-bit unsigned signal was interpreted as a positive value of 8. The 4-bit signed signal, on the other hand, was interpreted as a negative value of 8 because of the sign bit at the leftmost position. That's all I had for you in this tutorial about signed and unsigned types in VSGL. If you are coming from a background as a computer programmer, digital arithmetics shouldn't be new to you. You've heard it a million times. What's new in VSGL is that the vectors may have any lengths. 4 bits, 5 bits or 100 bits. The length is determined by you. If digital arithmetics is new to you, I suggest you read up on the subject. It's important to understand. You will have to learn it sooner or later, so why not sooner? Head over to Wikipedia and read the article on 2's complement. It's not that complicated, it's just primary school mathematics performed using binary numbers. Until the next time, thank you for watching and check out vhdlwist.com for more tutorials and blog posts.